Thank you very, very much for this really very exciting lecture. And I'm sure that a lot of questions will uh, arise. Please. Hello, I'm a food chemist. And uh, let's talk about food. Uh, you, for me, I'm not sure if actually we're the cleverest species on, the, uh, on Earth. Definitely we're the strongest. How clever are we when we make, uh, let's say, we destroy agricultural land to make biofuels? How clever are we when we spread around GM genes that we know, Royal Society knows, that they destroy the biodiversity? That's not very clever, is it? No. So I can't really understand why are you so optimistic? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a... We have a tremendous survival capability. That's the other reason why we're here. I said we love life. We also are very ingenious in, in, in finding our way out of situations. The, the, the thing which I find where I, I have the most difficulty in, in, in keeping my optimism going is just when I think about how we're going to collectively organize. I think taking us one at a time, we're not stupid. But taking us collectively, we're pretty stupid, particularly when we band into nations and we compete. And so that's why I'm saying that if we can find a, uh, an alter alternative, not alternative exactly, but at least modify our systems of governance to try and somehow project further into the future, to have people believe that there really are things that need to be done and must be done. You see, we are, we are, having, we are having meetings. I mean, we were discussing this afternoon with, you know, some, with the media um, about this. The question is, you do, how do you see Copenhagen? You know, was the, was the Copenhagen conference a disastrous failure? Or was it something where a little bit was extracted and then a little bit more in the next one? In Cancun, there'll be a little bit more. That's my optimism. Not that we shall suddenly solve it, but that we will move forward and we'll just squeak around the vortex in time. That's the best I can hope for. You talk about universities. I'm... I agree with you that the commercialization is a, a very big problem these days. I'm wondering whether we could not, if we work in, in an interdisciplinary manner, because in many ways what you're saying would uh, need cooperation between hard science and uh, lawyers, anthropologists, oh, yeah. what have you. And I think that uh, apart from having one university, Yale, to be an NGO, you should have a collection of universities. There are a number of you know, alliances and groups of this and that. Why not go to them and try to, to make them take it up as something that they felt obliged to do? Because I think it's, it may be difficult for one university, but for a, for a gathering of university, this might be the case. And I agree with you, I know quite a lot about uh, the COP15 in Copenhagen. Uh, and I think that uh, we should realize that this is a long and difficult process, uh, but we should uh, take it on as a responsibility, but, but try out solidarity in practice in, a way, in our way of, of dealing with it. Yes, yes, oh, no, I, I agree with you very much. I mean, if we look at the other, the other bits of governance we have going, I mean, you know, anybody who's dealt at all with the European Commission knows the difficulty of getting anything. You campaign for years, bit by bit. The biologists are doing this right now in order to try and get uh, more sustainable funding of infrastructure for, for biological databases that at the moment we don't have. Physicists did it long ago, you know, with their, with their machines, but now the biologists. And we, we realize at first hand how, how painful the process is. The American scientists know this very well. They deal with NIH over a period of time to, to develop new structures. And so I, I agree with you very much. We, we shouldn't be pessimistic, we should, but we should push forward. Now, as for the, yes, the, the universities banding together, I absolutely agree. I mean, we, 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 uh, we, we have these sparks arising here and there, and we should band them together. I mean, our, our I say um, unit in, in Manchester in one of those, and, and there are other units of that kind in Manchester institutes. Um, there's Joe Stieglitz's um, Committee for Global Thought, I think it is, at Columbia University, and so on and so on. And there's lots of room for alliances of this kind. And so, yes, I, I absolutely agree. I'm not trying to preclude any, any particular or specify any particular uh, way. It's not the whole university has to shift, but I think it's important that universities, the management of universities, see this as a vital part of their role. And some vice chancellors do this more than others. I mean, for example, the, the, the VC of, of, uh, of the University of British Columbia, Stephen Toop, who some of you may know, is very much um, on, on a green agenda, is promoting this kind of thing. So he's doing that there. So this is the way we should go forward, I think, yeah? 
way competition is a, is a big problem these days because it, it, it distorts cooperation, which we must do something about. It, it absolutely does. The competition between universities is exactly what leads them to grab the contracts. Yeah. My name is Paraskevopoulos. <laughs> Excuse me for being so long. I'm professor at the, at the Technical University of Athens. Uh, uh, professor Sultan, uh, uh, allow me uh, first of all to thank you for a very interesting uh, uh, talk, uh, uh, an interesting and uh, I would say very inspiring. My uh, way of thinking is that I think that things have changed so much that one thing that could help us to make uh, uh, great changes on the planet will be to create a new enlightenment. Mm -hmm. The things that you just presented to us, I think that is uh, very much in this way, and uh, furthermore, uh, uh, I think it's, it, it covers my, uh, my th way of thinking of an enlight enlightenment uh, to a great degree. Would you like to comment on this? Well, it's all, when, you're, when you're in the middle of something, it's, it's, um, it's bad to give it a grand label. The enlightenment is, was an episode, yes. Should we regard ourselves as a new enlightenment? Maybe we shall turn out to be. It would be wonderful if we were, but I think we need to be pragmatic, would be my comment on that. And what we have to do is to do what we have to do. And if, as, as the, for example, the, the combining model, as you've just heard, um, works, and if the, the, the model you're referring to works, then we shall indeed have a new enlightenment. But I'd be a little leery of calling it that in advance. <laughs> Let's see how we do. Yes, please. Professor Solson, I also need the, I feel the need to thank you profusely for an amazing talk. Uh, but in defense of poor Charles Darwin, uh, it is my understanding that he actually never used the term uh, the survival of the fittest. This was due to his uh, um, um, defenders and propagators, people like Huxley. Uh, but nevertheless, this is a, a uh, tiny point. Well, I'll come back. Yes, go on. Um, my, my, my main query and slight anxiety listening to you, because I, I happen to share wholeheartedly your views about the importance of a publicly funded uh, university which is free of the vagaries of the market. Nevertheless, from your own experience in Britain, I think you will concur that one of the most um, depressing aspects of the evolution of, un of universities um, in countries like yours was the moral enthusiasm with, the, with which our colleagues within the universities embraced the quasi-market. I, I, yeah, t two comments. I mean, on that, I, I, I really would try to back off from any sense, if I've given it, that it's all or none. Um, I would be very happy if we shift the balance a little bit. Uh, you know, I mean, universities, after all, used to earn their living by selling various things. I think they used to sell astrology at one time, and uh, the people were, when the people were working on astronomy, you know, that's how Galileo funded himself, for example. Um, and Newton uh, was up to all kinds of tricks, you know, financial tricks. So um, the, the idea of being commercial is, is not new and not even particularly uh, devastating, as long as it doesn't take over the whole thing. And that's, that's, it's that balance that I'm, I'm looking at and the, the sense that of falling easily into the... Into the uh, what the politicians would like the university to do, which is just deliver as much, as much market value as possible. That's what we have to fight. We have to say, sure, we'll deliver some market value, but that's not the only thing we do, and frankly, it's not the most important thing. So I want to say that. Uh, just a comment on the, on the Darwin thing. I actually don't know. He did use the phrase. He probably pref would have preferred not to. You're quite right in saying it wasn't his phrase, but he did actually use it in one of the editions, um, I think on the, not on the, it's not in the origin, I think it's in the, in the, uh, the one about human evolution. And I think he probably regretted doing that because it wasn't a very favorable um, phrase, misleading one. But he didn't invent it, you're quite right.
Uh, professor, my name is Miliaresis. I'm just a simple citizen. Um, thank you very much for this uh, extremely interesting presentation, um, which I think is also a wake-up call, and this is why it's extremely interesting. Um, at your presentation, and at one point, uh, you concluded by saying that the recent recession was also the cause of the result of a number of neglects on important issues. Um, do you think that this recession and uh, the global crisis that it produced will operate now as a global, uh, global wake-up call uh, in order to reach this balance to which you referred before? Thank you. Yes, I wish. I mean, I think a lot of us a year or two ago thought that it might be, and there's every sign that the world is eagerly returning to business as usual. So we, we do have to keep reminding people that something went wrong and there are structural defects. So it's certainly <laughs> not, not a, a wholesale reform of the financial system, but still extraordinary things happened. I mean, you know, the, the amount of uh, state interest taken in America, I mean, commercial interest in the banks is quite extraordinary. Uh, my own country in the UK, I think, is I mean, that's good. We seem to have given the bankers the money, but not asked very much in return at all. So that's that was not not a very good deal. Um, but but I certainly think yes, I would I would uh, defend very much my comments about lazily slipping into a certain way of doing things. And the the phrase which I I really think is is crucial is to, is the unregulated free market. And, and that's something we do get quite strongly from the US, um, also from Australia quite a bit, is, is pressure to say you shouldn't interfere with the market. And we have lots of good economists like Joe Stieglitz who are saying you absolutely have to set boundaries on the free market, otherwise it doesn't work. And it's a sort of a micro-macro thing in a way. You know, the free market is fine so long as it's working on a level playing field with, with fairly well-informed participants. And then you do indeed have the have what was it called, the magic hand or something that, uh, that creates the best possible, most efficient outcome. But as soon as you allow it to, to run freely globally, it doesn't work, and that's what happened with the financial system. And I have to say that, that, uh, that the UK was, was one of the worst offenders. We were rather in the position of the, of the pig farmer who started foot and mouth disease. We were being, uh, being uh, a little careless with our slops, financially speaking. Thank you for your speech. First of all, my name is Pesma Joglu. I'm coming from the industry of electronics, implanted microchips, RFID, etc. I wonder whether you have ever delivered such a speech to the politicians, financial analysts, rulers in general, and what <laughs> their reaction was. Yes, well, I think the answer is no, probably, although. I mean, I've done bits and pieces. I've certainly spoken, for example, not, uh, not, not rulers, but I've, for example, I've delivered something similar at World Intellectual Property Organization. It was not very well received by the representative of the pharmaceutical industry there. He tore me off a shred, but was completely inaccurate in his remarks. So, I mean, I'm afraid it's a truism that, that if people want to believe something, they won't accept um, anything to the contrary, they will only incorporate um, um, observations that fit their own their own worldview. Um, I, I suppose we should <coughs> um, spread it more, but in fact we are. I mean, I referred to the Manchester Manifesto, and uh, that was um, put out on the web, published in that way. It will be published more formally um, later on as well. And it did attract some political attention, and we got uh, several... Um, sort of interactions of that kind as a result. Um, I, I think we have to continue. The thing is, remember that politicians, like in particular, are bombarded with all kinds of conflicting interests, lobbyists, I referred to them, and uh, we only some among those. It will not be that a speech changes the world, but if you keep on delivering the speech, and that's up to all of you, if you like the speech, go and deliver it yourselves, you know, in your own terms. Let's have a movement. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, allow me to congratulate you again, like the others, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, well, my name is Elpidophoros. Uh, my, uh, my church, the head of my church, the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, has uh, gained a new title, uh, being as a Green Patriarch. We call 